There's also our shrimp goby, Silagobius mainlandi, um, a magnificent, magnificent snake eel, um, puffer fish, box fish, and also your snowflake eel. So these are the five species out of the eight that we saw visually. Four species were collected in the 16 clove oil stations that we conducted. Two of these are gobies which I've already talked about and we saw in our visual transects, uh, bathogobius and silagobius. Two other species were not found in visual surveys but did show up in the clove oil stations, Nathalipus angerensis and Asteropterus semipunctata. Okay, so this slide shows the percent occurrence of these four gobies by habitat type. Remember I did eight stations in the sandy areas and eight stations in the Alophila canopy itself. You can see that for three of these species, um, percent occurrence was much higher in just the sandy area. So this blue bar is just sand. And these three were much uh, more frequently collected in the sandy area. Um, and Silagobius was collected both in the sandy areas and also within the meadow itself. So the percent occurrence seems to be much higher in the sand rather than in the inside of the meadow itself. Does anyone have any questions this far? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm taking off. I'm just curious, how far away from the canopy was the sand? Uh, usually less than five meters. Because if this Pico Lagoon site or on the outside is, is really odd that once you get a few more meters away, you've got either Halamita on this side or Abronvillea on this side. So I've tried not to get too close to the Abronvillea because I was doing stations in there as well, but for, for the... Uh, for the Holophila stations, I wanted to keep it just in the immediate area. Is another question? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, all these so far are native fishes that we've talked about. All these are native gobies. Um, so, the, so far, we haven't found any of the um, any non native fishes in the Holophila Hawaiiana site. Um, but again, we've only done 16 stations there, so chances are you know, more species will show up uh, with time. Okay, again, this is percent abundant. So um, where were they most abundant? Again, most of these were most abundant in the sandy areas. Okay, these two species did not occur within the meadow at all. Bathogobius, uh, we had one individual show up within the meadow, but the ma majority of them showed up um, outside the meadow in the perimeter, the sandy area. And Silagobius, one was in the meadow and one was outside the meadow. So these are very low sample sizes, but you can still see that they tend to prefer the sandy areas and not occur in the meadow themselves. Because we're sampling over a given area in this uh, one and a half meter squared uh, tarp, we can get uh, estimates of density. And here's the same data, but just at, uh, density estimates. You can see that density is generally higher inside the sandy rubble area than on the outside um, or within the, the meadow canopy itself. We thus far have not uh, collected any invertebrates uh, within the Halophila Hawaiiana meadows. I do have invertebrates that we collected um, as a result of the clove oil stations, but uh, without our invertebrate expert here to identify them, they haven't been identified yet, so I'm not going to talk about invertebrates uh, in the Hawaiiana meadows. So summary for Hawaiiana, we found eight fish uh, species from five families, so very, very low diversity, uh, and in general, uh, gobies were the most diverse with four species, and diversity and abundance of fishes tend to be greatest uh, in the sandy areas uh, and lowest in the vegetated areas. Okay. And we didn't find any commercially or recreationally important fish species within the Hawaiian meadows. Again, very low sample size, but if you look quickly outside, a um, few feet to the right where there's Advanvillia, and you start to sample in there, Lots of little things, lots of parrot fishes, lots of juvenile manini and things like that, but we don't seem to find them in the Halophila stations. Yeah? Not being a scale person. Sure. Would the, would the location of the fish, would their habitat vary from day to night? That's an excellent question. Um, that's a very excellent question because some species like cardinal fishes do tend to range quite a uh, distance at night. Some cardinal fishes will actually move out a mile or more at night and forage in some of these beds. Um, so what we'd like to go out there and do is set some traps at night and see what shows up in the traps in the morning, uh, whether you're having things move out at night. It, it's very, very possible. So now we're going to move on to the Holophila discipients. Now remember, this is the deep water uh, seagrass uh, occurs 
35 millimeters, excuse me, 35 meters in depth or greater. Um, and this is work done off the south shore of Oahu. Okay, here you can see fish diversity by family uh, found in the Holophila decipiens meadows. We recorded uh, 38 species from over 17 fish families from the Holophila decipiens meadows. Now this right here is just based on the visual surveys alone. We haven't been able to get adequate clove oil information for this area, uh, so these numbers could indeed increase once we do that sampling. Labrids or wrasses was the most diverse group in there. I think we had something like 12 species of wrasses that we collected or observed in Holophila decipiens stations. Yeah. Oh, sure. Were, were the same species that were found in the shallow water found in the deeper water? With one exception, no. I think uh, Nathalepus, the goby, was found down there. And, and I think Echidna nebulosa, that, which is the snowflake moray, we also found down there as well. But otherwise, uh, the other gobies that we saw there, like Asteropteryx, they didn't occur that deep. So it tended to be a, a fairly different fauna. Are you trying to say, was it, was it a deep water effect or was it an algae or a, a seagrass effect? Um, that's a great question, and, and I don't know how shallow uh, some of these decipients can get. And maybe you could shake that out by looking for the shallowest decipients meadow you could find and, and see what the fish fauna is there. Um, it, one of the things that could also affect these diversity estimates is that one of our two decipient stations was right next to this big artificial reef called the Sea Tiger. So, a lot of these species that may not normally be associated with a seagrass meadow are hanging out there and might just move out over the meadow because it's you know, in very close proximity. Um, whereas if we just confined the diversity estimates to meadows that you know, are a long way from any type of reef, we'd probably get a lot lower fish diversity. So that would be interesting to tease that out, see what effect that has. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, that's why I'm hoping to, to conduct the clove oil stations because we're taking a set area. Um, because initially, when we were diving on this decipient's meadow off the sea tiger, we weren't collecting, we weren't gathering information. We were supposed to be learning how to do the diving that we were doing. So it was only out of the corner of our eye that we could look down there, record something. Uh, and we weren't able to do a whole lot of the work that we're able to do now, now that we're trained. So. Uh, if you can go out there with line transects and do some kind of quantifiable uh, thing with a transect and get an idea of density or something like that, that would probably be a good idea. So here you can see the same association we saw with Holophila hawaiana. Everybody's hanging out over the sand. Not too many species are hanging out over the seagrass themselves. So diversity tends to be a lot greater in the sand area. All, uh, I think it was 38 species occurred over sand, and three, addition, three of them also went over to the seagrass area itself. So diversity right in the seagrass canopy tended to be very low. These are the three guys that we actually found hanging out in the seagrass canopy. Um, one of them is a razorfish, Simoludes lecleusi. This is a wrasse. It sits there and swims around. It's very, very abundant there. And then when it's startled, it dives down into the sand. Uh, feeds on invertebrates. There's probably lots of invertebrates in the area that it's feeding on. Another one is a sand perch, Parapersis shaunus landi. And then we have one flatfish that's down there, Bophus pantherinus. So these are the three species that are actually in the meadow itself in the uh, seagrass canopy. Okay, here's just a sampling of the guys that are found outside uh, the canopy. So in the rubble area and the sandy areas, there's a whole lot of species there uh, from lots of different fish family. 